blessed is the man with a vision. Hallelujah. Father, we are grateful for today that we can gather, that we can open up your word. We thank you for a time of singing and a time of prayer. Lord, as we look at your word, as we look at familiar texts, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our life, that you would speak to us as only you can. Thank you that we can trust you and rest in you and give you praise. Amen. I'm working through Sermon on the Mount, just kind of started that a little bit, and, and I was thinking about the people Jesus was talking to as they were gathered on the side of the hill and how they would have thought of themselves. They had been told many, if you remember, the reason there was such a large crowd there is it said that Jesus had healed so many of them. Well, and, and we kind of blow past that and think, well, that's really good. Jesus healed them. But what was the standard view of sickness in that day was that if you were sick, you were a sinner, basically. You know, the disciples and Jesus come upon a man who's sick, and, and their most logical question is, well, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, well, it was neither one of them. It's for the glory of God, and that would have been revelatory to them. So you have a whole group of people that have gathered on the side of the hill to listen to Jesus that basically the religious rulers of the day would have described them all as a bunch of sinners and a bunch of losers because they were sick and they needed healing. And, and so then Jesus starts talking to them and he says things like, no, you guys are the salt of the earth. Salt's lost its taste. How shall it be salty? How shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And I kind of made a veiled reference that he probably was talking to the Pharisees about that. They were the current salt and light bearers of the day, and they had really totally blown it. And he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And this would have been revelatory to these people. This is Jesus, who we talked about being the smartest man who ever lived, telling them that their life actually mattered. Those who had been discarded and rejected and looked down on and despised and considered as nothing, he says, you guys are the ones that are the light and the salt. And, and they're starting to think, you mean my life really could mean something? Yeah, it could. The point of Jesus' illustration with salt and light and, and those type things, or at least part of the point, was that he was after something with his life. And you remember in his high priestly prayer, he starts off and he says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Jesus lived his life on earth to bring glory to the Father. That's important for us to remember. You're probably familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism, right? Most of us have heard of it at least. 107 questions and answers that millions of young people have been trained on down through the centuries. What's the first question? Remember the first question? What is the chief end of man? And most of the people in here probably know the answer, right? What is it? We'll cheat. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We're supposed to glorify God with how we live. Throughout the gospel, Jesus is saying things like, I want you to see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you uh, see the works that I do, they bring glory to the Father. They reflect on Him. You want to know what the will of the Father is? It's to believe in the one that He sent. And He's constantly pointing back to the Father. I and the Father are one. I'm only doing what the Father has said. Look at the Father. <laughs> glory to the Father. And the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at it and read it in its entirety, as I've been encouraging you guys to do, it basically it's going to explain how, are we, how we are supposed to live as his disciples, how we are supposed to walk out this life that we have here after we enter the kingdom. Our life will reveal what we think, what we believe, what we actually believe, because a tree will bear the fruit that it is supposed to bear. You're not going to get pears off of an apple tree. And it goes back to how we actually live our lives. See, something happens when we meet Jesus. Everything changes. Yeah. Everything changes. Our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, our motivations. It all begins to change. Amen. We looked briefly at salt. And salt to them, when Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, would mean more to, than you know, me. I think of a salt shaker on a table. You know, and that, That's basically as deep as I go on salt. In their world, they didn't usually use salt shakers. 
Salt would have meant preserving. It would have meant flavoring. It would have meant to be sprinkled on stuff to stop decay because they didn't have refrigeration. And, and it's not too much of a stretch of our imagination to say that Jesus is saying to them, you guys and the way you actually live is helping to prevent decay in the society. That when the kingdom of God comes in, it's going to stop the downward spiral that is going on all around us. Here's a sentence. God's people have always been called out of the world to remain in the world, showing how to live differently than the world. Does that make sense? We follow an entirely different set of values and morals than the world system. And it has always been that way. Now, I know it's hard to imagine, but sometimes people get upset with, with me and people like me when I start challenging things that people do, particularly young people, but it's not just young people, but when they, when they quote a verse to me as a justification for all manner of carnal behavior that they want to do, 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become like someone to win them, and therefore I'm going to get pierced, tattooed, colored, buy a motorcycle, get a pool table, whatever I'm going to do, and they throw it under that verse because I'm supposed to be relevant. And I'm saying that, that is probably one of the baddest, worst, baddest, horrible interpretations of that passage that there is. The point of that passage is to win people to the gospel. And it's the point of that passage is Paul dies to himself, not glorifies or gratifies his flesh. He dies to himself in order that other people might hear the gospel. It's never been suggested anywhere in the pages of the scripture that we adopt the culture in order to be relevant. It's not there. What you will find is be holy, be separate, come out from among them, be a light in the darkness, be different. Never does it say become like, imitate, adopt. And so when I have these conversations with people and you know, the blood starts coming up in my face when I'm saying... Just be honest with what you're doing. If you want to do those things, then be honest about it. I want to be cool, or I want to be in, or I want to be accepted, or I want to, uh, whatever it is. I want that. Then at least be honest about it. Now, if you want to have a discussion about the heart motives of why you're doing that, let's go there too. <laughs> we can have that discussion. But we're to be salt and light. We're to season the culture, not the other way around not the main point of the message but it certainly ties into the salt is that Jesus is going to use the rest of his message the rest of his sermon and get down in our face so to speak on gut level issues this is how you deal with anger this is how you deal with lust this is how you deal with divorce this is when you give your word have it actually mean something this is what you do with revenge this is what you do with money this is what you do with forgiveness this is what you do with fasting this is what you do with fear and worry and doubt you know the stuff where we live and he says, this is what kingdom people do because we're to be different. And what we are supposed to be doing is reflecting the light that is in there. Jesus Christ came on the scene and he said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Who's he referring to? Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light. Why? So that you may become sons of the light. If there's nothing else we get out of reading the scripture when Jesus is talking about these illustrations of salt and light, is that light is different than darkness. We're not told to imitate darkness and embrace darkness. We are told to expel darkness by light. Darkness cannot overcome light. He's talking to a culture, and again, we have to step back in it a little bit and think, they didn't have electricity back then. Having moved out into the country a couple years ago, and you're driving down the street and there's no street lights, it's dark. You know, I like to turn off my headlights and just see how dark it is. You know, just to, look at this, stop it. You know, but it's really dark. And these guys are living in a in a society and a culture where they didn't have electricity, and they were living in a culture that was under this demonic blanket of religious hypocrisy, where the ones who were supposed to be salt and light had distorted the gospel, uh, the truth of God. They didn't have the gospel necessarily yet, but they distorted the truth of God in such a place to where um, oppression was normal, injustice was normal, hypocrisy was common, justification for all manner of evil. 
And so Jesus comes on the scene, and man, you got, you got to back up into it sometimes when you're reading through the scripture and you run into a passage, and Jesus said, says things that are just you know, mind-altering if you actually thought about you saying this to somebody. And Jesus is talking to the religious leaders on many occasions, and he says, Woe to you, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! <laughs> for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would go to enter in. They're standing in front of the door of the kingdom of God with their arms barred and said, no, you can't go in. I'm not going in and you're not getting in either. And Jesus goes, woe to you guys. You have got to be kidding. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplace and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. They love the place of influence. Love to sit up front, march on in and have everybody look at them and take their seat of prestige and be honored and hey, rabbi and bow, bow down to them and all the stuff that went on. And they loved all of that. And Jesus said they're devouring widows' houses. Can you imagine? What that, what, how do you get to that place in your thinking? The widow in their days would be a lot different than the widow in our day. They would have nothing, and you're going to go in and steal it? Well, yeah, I mean, I deserve it. After all, she doesn't. Or he, you know, it's mine. And Jesus said, you, you guys are, are, are hypocrites. He said some of the most incredible things. Uh, this one's one of my all-time favorites. They're fussing with him because his disciples didn't wash their hands. And, and he says to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? <laughs> Don't you love that? Isaiah, the word of God, the great prophet, spoke about you guys, and what he said is you're hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they teach, or do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. What a, what a comment to these guys. You're standing in the place of God. Moses, who you revere, said, honor your father and mother, and you say, ah, you know, I've dedicated this to God, you can't have it. Go eat out of the dumpster. They didn't have dumpsters, but go eat something else. I'm not going to take care of you. But it, it gets worse. He says, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, you, you remember this? They're having this discussion about being faithful. And Jesus ends this, this powerful illustration. He says, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love the one or hate the other. You can't serve God and money. And then it says this, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. <laughs> and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. <laughs> light, darkness. They're standing in the place of where light should be, proclaiming who God is. And Jesus says these things to him. Again, another one of my all-time favorites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte or a convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. <laughs> Can you imagine this conversation going on with somebody? Think about it. What Jesus is saying here. The pride. The arrogance the disgust of others, the hatred of everyone that's outside of their little group, the, the legalism over the minor details that were going on. The, 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 they would swallow a camel, as that illustration is. You know, they strain out a gnat, and then they were swallowing a camel. <laughs> what a picture, as my friend there is saying. The ability to sit in the seat of Moses. I still marvel over this every time I, I read through the Bible and I get to this because I've sat in so many meetings in my life. I've done so many planning meetings where you have your whiteboard or you have your brainstorming sessions and you're throwing out ideas and you're trying to come up with a solution to something. And, and so everybody's bantering around. And I try to picture this meeting. 
where the religious rulers are sitting around deciding how they're going to kill Jesus. Can you imagine that meeting? These are the guys that are the, the rulers and leaders of, of God's church in that day. They're the ones that God has said, you lead my people. And so they're sitting around having a brainstorming session about how they're going to kill Jesus. What a meeting that must have been. Or they got mad because Lazarus was raised from the dead. Four days dead, comes out of the tomb. Everybody sees it. It's never happened before. And so what should we do? Let's give glory to God. No, let's have a meeting and let's kill him too. <laughs> no wonder Jesus says things to him that are, well, calling them darkness is being kind, if you think about it. Snakes, graves full of dead man's bones, liars, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, deceivers, fools, blind guides, just to name a few that Jesus was saying. But what did Jesus say to the people that were listening to him? The ones who had been rejected by all these other people. The ones who had been looked down on and put down on, the ones that had been barred from the kingdom of God, were the ones that, that are standing there in front of the door saying, you can't go in. Jesus says to them, you're the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Your light will be seen by how you actually live your life. You know, how we go to work, how we shop. How we spend money, how we drive, how we respond or not, how we handle hurts, wounds, anger, bitterness, how we treat one another, how we walk with each other in relationships, how we speak, how we dress. Anything that anybody can see reflects on the ones that we claim we walk, for, walk with and under, doesn't it? Does it not reflect yes. on him? <laughs> of course it does. It did then, it does now. Jesus says... Look, here's part of the problem. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. Why? Well, their works will be exposed. <clears throat> so the things done in secret are eventually going to be shattered from the rooftops, isn't that what it says? But one of the reasons why we're, we're fearful to go and ask God if what we're doing is right or wrong or what our heart is or whatever is because we don't want our works and our deeds exposed. Because God will get down to the absolute motives of our heart. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to look like that, act like that, speak like that, dress like that, do that, do this? Why do you want to? Why? Those are good questions worth asking. What's the chief end of man? To take care of myself, to meet my needs, to be satisfied, to be included, to be cool, to be great, to be loved. What's the chief end of man? To enjoy God and give glory to Him forever. That's going to get down to motivations. Jesus said, people don't light a lamp and put, her under, put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, thus tying it together, what are we supposed to do? Well, let your light shine before others. You mean I have a light? Yeah, you do. You sitting out there, you on the hill back listening to this the first time, you and I sitting here, we have a light. We have a light. And he says, you don't stick it under a basket. You don't hide it. You let it shine. We're part of what's going on in the kingdom. How? how? <laughs> in the same way, how am I supposed to do that? Well, why don't you let people see your works? Oh, there he goes on works. Uh, we're not saved by works, obviously. But once we're saved, we work. Yes. And because I started off with saying when we are born again, everything radically changes in our life, shouldn't there be a before and after when we're born again? Shouldn't there be a difference in the way we live and act? And work. And he says, how do we let our light shine? Well, let them see your works. Let them just see how you respond to things. Let them see that, that you treat somebody who has a, an offensive lifestyle differently than other people treat them. This was prayed for. Let's, let's see how you, how you handle it when people say things to you that aren't nice or are unkind or they didn't treat you in the way you think you deserve to be treated or your boss comes and you're already overloaded and he dumps a bunch more stuff on you and you act like everybody else or are you different because of the kingdom and because of Jesus Christ? How do we do it where we actually live? Let them see your good works. See, how we think is going to reveal what we really believe. How we live 
proceeds. I don't know if I said that the right way, but what we think is what we'll do. What we do reveals what we really believe. I used to teach financial stuff all the time, and I said, just, just give me your checkbook, and I'll tell you what's important to you. Because it, it reflects what you actually do. That's what's important to you. And it comes from what we think and what we believe. We know we're not saved by our works. It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. We're born again from the free gift of grace. We become new creations now alive in him because of what he and only he could do and did do. We were formerly dead, now we're alive. We are new creations in Christ, but after we are new, we live differently. We begin to go a different direction, and we walk that out. Every single one of us walk it out. The old is gone, the new has come. We will grow, and we will work, and we will do things in the name of our King. Jesus is going to get to the root of so many issues. And again, I'm challenging you to read this sermon over and over and over again. But he's going to get to, the, to, the, to where we live. You know, anger. <laughs> how, we, how we treat one another relationally. Greed, forgiveness, unforgiveness, revenge, prayer, all that stuff. All the way down to worry and fear and so forth. It's the minute by minute, day by day life that we have in a kingdom. And Jesus is going to lay this out and did lay it out for us to look at it and say... You can do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and the point of all of it, if you read it, he had a point in what he was after. Every sermon, the guy who creates it, the guy who has the message, has something he's after. Sometimes it's more conv- convoluted than other times, and sometimes maybe it's more difficult to get to. But everybody has a point of what they're after. What was Jesus after? You're reading the Sermon on the Mount, read it through that lens. He's the smartest man who ever lived. He's he's perfect. And he gave a a, a perfect sermon with a point. And what is that point? What a good grid to read it through. I would challenge you to do so. Because the bottom line, there's only two camps in this world, as I share on a regular basis. There are those who are in the family born again, and there are people who are not. And that's it. There's not a lot of mushy middle there. There is no mushy middle. You're either born again or you're not born again. You're part of God's family or you're not, period. And he's saying, when you become part of the family, you enter into the kingdom of God and you have a light. Now, we're all going to have different sized lights, right? And we're all going to have different degrees of saltiness in our life and we're going to have different lights. And some people take their lights far and wide and they go all over the world and they share the glory of the gospel everywhere. And some people have a very little light. But you know what's common about light regardless of how big or bright or or the realm that it has light cannot be defeated by darkness ever we make this room as dark as you could possibly make it make it pitch black where you can't see an inch in front of your face any size light is going to be seen any size light a match it's going to happen we're all called light you are the light of the world you are the light of the world you are the light of the world. You have a light. And what's the point of it? Circling back around, what is the point of the light? What is the point of it? So that we can have good works and everybody can look at us and say, oh, they're such wonderful Christians? Or is it to bring glory to God the Father by how we actually live our lives? Isn't that the point, chief end of man? So let me ask you a few questions. I say this all the time, but sometimes we don't always stop and think about it, or maybe think about it as deeply as we should, but when we are born again, everything begins to change. The question they ask is how and why. I guess that's two questions. How and why. How does it begin to change, and why does it begin to change? Is it just fire insurance so we can get out of hell? Right? I got saved, punch that ticket, I'm good. Or is there something more than that? If you become born again, what does that mean? Most of us in here are familiar with babies. We've heard a few of them. We know a few of them, right? Many of you in here were babies at one point, believe it or not. Probably all of us. Amen. Some of us are still babies. now. But the point is, new life starts, right? And we have this little baby, and it's new life. And it's radically different than it was before it was there. 
And then we watch it grow and it changes and matures. We mature, we grow once we are born again. There is a definitive beginning of that new life. And that's when we're born again. And everything changes, doesn't it? Shouldn't it? So when I'm having debates with people or people are coming and trying to justify actions to me that, that, that are anti-biblical, unscriptural things, and I'm saying, hey, you know, you're born again. You're a new creation in Christ. Isn't this how we're supposed to live? So think about it. Why does it change? How can you and I, living our daily lives, bring glory to God? I mean, some of us live routine boring lives we get up we do the same things over and over and over and over again can we bring glory to God in that how do we do that how do we do that who was Jesus talking to when he said you're the light of the world you're the salt he was talking to farmers and fishermen and tax collectors and slaves and laborers a few managers thrown in there, here or there, business owners, I'm sure. And he said, you guys are the salt. Okay, how does that work in the auto repair business? Or how does that work in the income tax business? Or the real estate business? Or the insurance business? Or the laborer business? How does it work like that? How do you be salt and light where you are? How can you live your life to bring glory to God doing the things you do? It's a good question to ask. Isn't it the chief end of man? So how do I do it? When I get up tomorrow and go to work, I say, I want to bring glory to you, God. How do I do that? What a great question to ask. Maybe it has to do some with how we respond to people. Maybe it has to do with how we love people. Maybe it has to do with our faithfulness. Maybe it has to do with nothing overtly obvious where we're plastered with bumper stickers. Maybe it has to be with how we live our lives. So, young people in here, how can you let your light shine right where it is? I mean, I got school tomorrow, right? Get up, got school, I'm going to do the same old thing I'll do every day. I got math, science. Can you let your light shine there? Is it possible? Thank you. I got one. one one's going to let his light shine, the rest of you are going to complain. How do we let our light shine? How do we bring glory to God by how we actually live? How do we do that? Don't you, don't you think we ought to ask that question? If you're in here and you're a young person and you know Jesus, shouldn't you want to know how to let your light shine right where you are? Would it come down to something as, as simple as having a respectful attitude in your home? Loving your brother and sister like you're supposed to? Showing honor? to those who are due honor? Would it have something being faithful? When you gave your word, you did it. When you, when you said you'd do something, you did it. Could it really be that simple? It's part of it, don't you think? Because the opposite is also true, isn't it? I, mean, I, know, I know you're tired. So maybe it comes down to our definition of a good work. What do we call a good A good work is where I have to leave the country and go work somewhere and build houses for the impoverished people. Yes, that is a good work. Could, it, uh, could a good work be being diligent and faithful at your job or at your studies or in relationships or any of the things that, that we encounter on a regular basis? Being a good steward with the finances we have? Could, could that really be a good work? Could it really be just being kind to somebody who's nasty, who doesn't deserve kindness? Could it really be loving somebody that hates us? Is it really that simple? It seems like Jesus said some things about that, didn't he? Could it really be about not returning a slap in the face when we get one, whether physically or verbally? Could it really be that? Could it really be including somebody in our little world that, that's on the outside wishing they were in there and we know they're out there and, and yet we ignore them? Could it really be something that simple? as a good work? I think these questions matter. I challenge you to think about it. And you get up tomorrow and say, man, I'd really like to do some works for God. Okay, great. Make your bed. <laughs> God doesn't care if I make my bed. 
Yeah, but your mother does. Will you honor her by doing that? Nobody told me. I'm just throwing that out, okay? I, mean, just, I wasn't paid. I'm just throwing this out for whatever. Anyway, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. Who was, was that for you? All right. Lord, I'm so grateful that uh, you've given us new life in your son. And Lord, it is a new life. Everything changes begins to change and you renew our minds as we spend time in your word and and it isn't just something we do on Sunday mornings in some religious way it happens every hour of every day as we walk with you Lord I thank you for new life I thank you so much for it and God I thank you that you have given us your word that teaches us how to walk out this life moment by moment day by day as I think of the crowd sitting there hanging on every word Jesus was saying, he was talking to normal people, just a regular bunch of people. And he said, we're salt and light, and our lives can matter. Just giving a helping hand somewhere, giving a kind word, just not saying something that doesn't need to be said. <laughs> There's so many ways, Lord that we can walk this life out and bring glory to your name. And I pray you would show us how to do it. Each one of us, as we think about this, as we walk through this week, that you would show us how to put your word into practice. And Lord, help us to be people of your word. Whether I did a good job or not opening it up, I, I pray that your people would go back to your word and study it and be changed by it. And God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know you or somebody who will listen to this later that, that doesn't know you, I pray they'd meet you. They would bow their hearts and minds. They'd fall on their face before you and be born again and find new life, a life worth living. Because, Lord, you have given us works to do. You said we're your workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works <laughs> that you've prepared for us. So, Lord, I pray that we would seek you and that we would end up doing the things you have for us to do. And the ultimate purpose is to bring great glory to your Father and ours. So Lord, show us how to do that. We commit it into your hands and give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.